Howdy, we're discussing <clears throat> hydrogen sulfide, some of the things that affect its formation. And <clears throat> during fermentation, particle size, of course, has quite an effect. The <clears throat> smaller the particle size, the more hydrogen sulfide is formed. With pH, <clears throat> the lower the pH, the greater the hydrogen sulfide formation. And <clears throat> with temperature, a direct correlation between temperature and the formation of hydrogen sulfide. The higher the temperature, the greater the formation. And there was a great difference in yeast strain. I'm just reviewing what I covered <clears throat> last Friday. With uh, number of yeast strains checked, hydrogen sulfide ranged from 1 to 12 milligrams per liter. So that's really a very, very large range. But the most important factor of all is the juice clarity. If your juice is clear, you don't get hydrogen sulfide formation. If the juice is cloudy, the chances are good that you will get hydrogen sulfide formation. So that's why we recommend clearing the juice prior to fermentation, either by refrigerating, adding sulfur dioxide, allow it to stand overnight and then rack off, or even better, to centrifuge the juice. Because if you centrifuge, you're not going to end up with a bunch of leaves. Unfortunately, still in racking, you allow the leaves ranging all the way from 5 to up to 25% of the total volume of juice. Someone asked me when I was discussing uh, ion exchange what the flow rate was. I told at that time I had forgotten. I'd have to look it up, so I did. 4 to 5 gallons per minute per cubic foot of resin. Yes? Is this a pressurized system to achieve Yes. The uh, line is pumped through the uh, resin bed. Well, I've discussed the formation of hydrogen sulfide during fermentation. Now I want to discuss the factors affecting its formation after fermentation. Can I ask you a question on fermentation? Yes. You said the particle size, um, and some, the smaller the particles, the more H2S forms. Right. But then you say a clear juice, there's no formation. Wouldn't In a clear juice, the particles would be a lot smaller. I was talking about the elemental sulfur particles. I'm sorry. Oh. Any other questions or remarks about hydrogen sulfide formation during fermentation? Before we get on to the after fermentation. Well, there are a number of factors that affect it. One, absence or presence of yeast. Now, if you have clear wine, <clears throat> no yeast or yeast sediment present, when elemental sulfur or sulfur dioxide, either one, elemental sulfur powder sulfur or sulfur dioxide <clears throat> is added to clear wine in the absence of yeast, no hydrogen sulfide was produced. Whereas, if elemental sulfur or sulfur dioxide is added to wine containing yeast, hydrogen sulfide was produced. So that is one of the main reasons why we want to get rid of the yeast and other settling as quickly as possible after fermentation. Because the fast we get rid of the yeast, and the other suspended material, the less the chance of hydrogen sulfide formation. Now, <clears throat> iron, zinc, and tin, if they were present in peaceful amounts, 
in wines contain a high amount of sulfur dioxide, say 200, 250 parts per million of sulfur dioxide, iron, zinc, and tin can cause appreciable formation of hydrogen sulfide. That's all together? It's a no, effort? any one of those three or combinations thereof. Yes? How often is that going to occur? They're just reducing agents. Now the detectable level in wine between one to one milligram per liter. It'll depend a lot on the wine and also upon the individual's sensitivity to hydrogen sulfide. But somewhere between one tenth <coughs> and one milligram per liter is the detectable level in wine. Well, once we get hydrogen sulfide in the wine, how are we going to get rid of it? There are several methods. Sulfur dioxide addition. One of the oldest methods in use. Here's one experimental piece of work on the removal of hydrogen sulfide. Added 25 parts per million SO2 to a, <coughs> to a wine containing 11 parts per million. Removed 97% of the H2S, which was initially present in amount of 1.5 parts per million. So the addition of 25 parts per million of SO2 to a wine containing 11 parts per million removed 97% of the H2S, or 97% of 1.5 parts per million, and this in a period of five days. And aeration following this treatment removed the last traces of the hydrogen sulfide. Yes? You mean free, the last parts per million free? Right, right, free. Now the reaction is usually postulated to occur this. Two hydrogen sulfide plus SO2 two waters plus three elemental sulfur. In other words, the hydrogen sulfide is changed over to elemental sulfur, oxidized elemental sulfur. Now, that, as I mentioned, is the oldest method for removal of hydrogen sulfide, Add, <coughs> adding sulfur dioxide and then aerating. A newer method is adding copper sulfate. And this has been approved by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. So it's an approved method. The <clears throat> material that has been approved for use contains bentonite, activated carbon, and of course copper sulfate is the active principle. The regulations specify that you cannot add more than five tenths part per million <coughs> copper in the form of copper sulfate. And the copper remaining in the wine must not exceed two tenths parts per million. The copper sulfate, the addition of copper sulfate, is the best method and the surest method we have for the removal of hydrogen sulfide because it reacts with the hydrogen sulfide to precipitate out the sulfur as, or as copper sulfide. Yes? You are not permitted to add more than five tenths parts per million of copper in the form of copper sulfide, <coughs> copper sulfate, 
and your wine after the treatment must not contain more than two tenths of a part per million of copper. As long as the <clears throat> odor in the wine is due entirely to hydrogen sulfide, it's not too bad because ordinarily we can deal with hydrogen sulfide, we can get rid of it. Though it's still better not to have it form in the first place. Uh, the danger of hydrogen sulfide is that <clears throat> it changes on standing. <clears throat> and this rotten egg odor of hydrogen sulfide on standing over a period of time <clears throat> in storage will change to what is described as a dirty, stagnant, somewhat onion-like odor. And once that occurs, then you do have a problem because that's very, very difficult to get rid of. And this is due to the formation of mercaptans. Ethyl mercaptan. And it's thought to arise from the reaction of <coughs> hydrogen, sulfide, hydrogen sulfide with acid aldehyde. In other words, the reaction of hydrogen sulfide with acid aldehyde will give rise to the formation of ethyl mercaptan. And a high level of hydrogen sulfide and high temperatures favor the formation of the mercaptans. Now, to impress on you the importance of preventing the formation, get rid of the hydrogen sulfide before you have a chance for the formation of mercaptans, Here's the difference in threshold levels in air of the two. Hydrogen sulfide in air to one hundredth part per million. <coughs> Ethyl mercaptan in air. 10 to the minus 7. So it doesn't take very much ethyl mercaptan to be present to give the wine a disagreeable, very unpleasant odor. Yes? Um, in this reaction here, when you have a formation of sulfur from H2S after you add SO2, um, should you, how quickly should you filter off? from the sulfur, you have a chance of going backwards again. Yes, get rid of it as soon as you can. Is allowed to sit for five days and then filter? Several days ordinarily is enough. And then fill out the elemental sulfur because there's a chance of it reverting again. And with the um, copper sulfate treatment, well, the material that's prescribed for treatment contains bentonite, so it'll settle out pretty rapidly. And then you can fill it off with that. Yeah, yes? Are the mercaptans formed during fermentation also, or do they just <coughs> Ordinarily, they are not formed until after the, the fermentation. <coughs> the hydrogen sulfide is formed during fermentation and can also form after. You said that ethyl mercaptans are formed from H2S reaction with, reacting with acid aldehydes and with presence of high levels of sulfide? The high levels of hydrogen sulfide and high temperature favor the reaction. Any other questions on this? Now I want to talk about sulfur dioxide. One of the, if one could use the term, one of the indispensable additives that we use in making wine. Been a prize posted in France since the early 1900s of, I don't know, $50,000 for it. It's an acceptable substitute for sulfur dioxide, and no one's ever claimed it. Because sulfur dioxide is 
twofold purpose. One, it aids in the fermentation by paralyzing the yeast and giving the natural yeast culture a chance to take over before the uh, the added yeast culture tends to take over before the uh, wild yeast recovers, and of course it's an antioxidant. Yeast inhibitor and an antioxidant. Now in aqueous solution, you have a series of equilibriums. Gas, SO2, aqueous, and the SO2 aqueous plus water to H2SO3. H2SO3 is in equilibrium with hydrogen and the bisulfite form, HSO3. And the association constant for that is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 2. And the HSO3 is in equilibrium with hydrogen plus SO3. And the dissociation constant for that is 5 times 10 to the minus 6. And finally, 2H. SO3 to the pyrosulfite plus water. So those are all the equilibrium reactions you have when you make up an SO2 water solution. And all forms of sulfur dioxide in <coughs> this equilibrium are called or known as free sulfur dioxide. Now the bisulfide ion, the HSO3, is one of the most important forms that can exist in an aqueous solution for two reasons. One is that <clears throat> the bisulfide ion can react with aldehydes, dextrins, Pectic substances, anthocyanins, <clears throat> and also with sugars containing an aldehyde uh, group to form bisulfide addition compounds. The reason this is important is because it removes the sulfur dioxide from effective use in the solution. It ties it up so tightly that it is no longer effective as an antioxidant or as a yeast inhibitor. And this is used to consider to be the reaction the aldehyde plus simple addition reaction. So that's responsible for diminution of color in red wines if you have a lot of sulfur dioxide added there because it'll add on to the either the two or the four position of the <clears throat> heteropsychic ring and cause decolorization. And as I say it can be removed from effective action because it's tied up with aldehydes and other constituents. So the ratio of free to bound sulfur dioxide in a given wine depends on the kinds and amounts of various constituents that are present and, of course, on the pH. And here's the effect of pH.
And here's the percent in the form of H2SO3 of the total amount of sulfur dioxide that's present. pH 28, 10, 3, and 1. So over a range of one pH unit, you get a tenfold range in the amount of sulfur dioxide that's present in the H2SO3 form. And here are some of the substances binding SO2 in solution. Acetaldehyde, pyruvic acid, alpha keto glutaric. acid, and glucose. And this is the dissociation constant. One point five times ten to the minus six, four times ten to the minus four, eight point eight times ten to the minus Four and 6.4 times 10 to the minus 1. You can see that acetaldehyde is a very, very strong binder of sulfur dioxide. Pyruvic acid is good. Alpha ketoglutaric acid is fairly good. Glucose is a very weak binder. Because here's the percent bound acetaldehyde 100. 66. 47 and one tenth percent. So that's why the amount and the type of substances that are present in the wine has such a decided effect upon the sulfur dioxide action in the, in the wine. Now, as a fungicide, here's the order of increasing fungicidal power. SO3 H SO3 and H2 SO3. And that's why you can see from here that the lower the pH, the more effective the SO2 is going to be as a fungicide because there'll be more of it in the form of the H2SO3. 2,8 pH, 10% is in the form of the H2SO3, 1 pH higher, only 1%. So that's why the lower the pH, the more effective the SO2 is as a fungicide. The, the H2SO3 is the most effective? Is the most effective. In other words, the non-dissociated form is the most effective. That's why the low pH, of course, is going to put more of it into the non-dissociated form because the hydrogen ion is going to prevent the dissociation, the increase in hydrogen ion. So this brings us to <coughs> recommendations as to amounts of free sulfur dioxide for different types of wines. This is a recommendation of Dr. Rankin of the Australian Research Institute, and I certainly agree with his recommendation. This is free SO2 recommended. Wine type. And these are the pH ranges. Less than 3.3, 3.3 three, three, three to 3.6 and more than 3.6. Wine type, white table, red table,
that MLF stands for malolactic fermentation. So there's two recommendations on red table wines, before malolactic fermentation, after malolactic fermentation. And dessert wines, and sherries. It's all right, I've got to specify this, floor sherry. White table wines, less than 3.3, 3, 20 parts per million. 40 in this range, and 70 here. So you can see that the pH is very, very important because only a drop of three tenths in pH, you can more than cut in half the amount of sulfur dioxide that's required to give the desired protection. Red table wines before mill like fermentation, five, 10, 15. After, 10, 15, and 20. Anyone tell me why we want less in red wines than in white? Why they're ranked? Any other reason? You want the male lactic to go? No, after the male lactic's over. Because red wines are contain a lot more of antioxidants than whites. Dessert wines, five. 10, 15, floor sherries, zero, zero, zero. Why zero on floor sherries? <laughs> Amen. Now a couple of, or three references. Questions on sulfur dioxide? How much fertilizer entirely according to the pH and also the uh, amount and type of the uh, binding constituents. So you sort of have to know what's in the wine? And how well, it's, it's possible to analyze, determine the <coughs> weight percent of acetaldehyde, pyruvic acid, alpha ketoglutaric acid, that will generally account for about 70 of the binding, 70 percent of the total binding power of the wine. It's not necessary. There's a much simpler way of determining the uh, amount of sulfur dioxide you must add to get the free sulfur dioxide content. Divide the wine into two aliquots, <coughs> add a different amount of sulfur dioxide to the two aliquots. Let's stand for five days and uh, then measure the free sulfur dioxide. Then you can just draw a line between the two points and extend the line out. That's all there's to it. Works very well. Uh, when, when the wine is in storage, uh, you're going to continue to bind after, uh, when the wine is in storage. Uh, do you have to then, how frequently should you check this and, and make it up if necessary? In bulk storage of white wines, if they're stored in wood, 
Sulfur dioxide should be run once a month. If they're stored in stainless steel and the tanks are full or they're under nitrogen pressure, then it's not necessary to run as often. Any questions on this O2? <clears throat> H2SO3 is the one that's that's, that's the one that has the greatest fungicidal action. And that's why the low pH favors the fungicidal action of sulfur dioxide because it limits the dissociation. Well, you had your greater than and less than arrows indicating that uh, SO3 was a greater fungicide than uh, than the others. I reverse my arrows every once in a while. You have to put up with me on that. <laughs> SO2, HSO3, H2SO3 in increasing order of fungicidal power. And over a pH range of 1 from 2.8 to 3.8, there is a tenfold increase in the tenfold decrease in the fungicidal action going from the lower to the higher pH. Yes. Acetaldehyde. Three main ones, of course, acetaldehyde, pyruvic acid, and alpha-ketoglutaric acid. And everything else that's in wine will generally account for about 30%. Those three will account for about 70% of the binding power. Well, this <coughs> period is listed as a discussion section. I put in discussion sections for two reasons. One is to take up the slack when I don't get through with my lectures on a scheduled time. This lecture that I just finished now I was supposed to have been finished last Friday, but we got held up for some reason or other. The other is to give you a chance to bring up any discussion that will be of interest to you or any questions you want to ask of anything that's been covered in the preceding lectures or things that haven't been covered. Yes? Um, you've described it, um, a number of different wine processing devices. Is there a, a reference that you could that would give pictures of these things. Like I was, I'm not very good at picturing that kind of thing. I was wondering if I could go somewhere and take a look at it. Yes, te technology of winemaking. As illustrations, I think, will cover everything that you need. I recommend that book because I'm one of the co-authors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, table wines. If you're interested strictly in table wines, then I'd recommend table wine first. If you're interested in both table and dessert wines, then I recommend technology of winemaking. Back on the subject of uh, H2S, uh, when you're talking about adding sulfur to wine after the leaves are gone and seeing whether uh, H2S was formed, are there other things that you could add that would produce the H2S from this wine? Uh, there was something about, I read somewhere about polysulfides would also, in wine, give rise to H2S? Well, some of the recent work done by Brian Crozier presents pretty good evidence that the sulfur does not exist in the wine as hydrogen sulfide or elemental sulfur, that there is a number of forms there, and they're all in equilibrium with each other, including the polysulfides. Does that answer your question? Um, I'm not sure. Well, if, if you did add something in the form of polysulfide, would you then get H2S production? Or if that, that was there, would you be getting H2S? You could, or you could not. <laughs> yes? Sir, could you be uh, uh, more specific? Uh, earlier we asked a question on uh, ion exchange and how it affects the quality of wine. And other than the addition of sodium, could you be more specific on how it affects uh, wine quality? Sodium, increase in the sodium content is the biggest deleterious effect. You can have a deleterious pH effect. 
If you exchange the hydrogen form and you exchange too far, or if you're using the hydroxyl form and you boost the pH too high, you will also remove some <clears throat> color and some tannic materials from red wines because they absorb quite strongly to the resin. And it's also possible to badly aerate the wine when you're putting it through a ion exchange column unless precautions are taken. That's all I can think of. In that respect, if you were uh, growing a wine or making wine in the Central Valley where you had uh, low acid form, would it be generally a good idea, and you're making a, a table wine, would it be generally a good idea to ion exchange them and take the uh, as with an acid uh, resin? Right. In fact, it's <coughs> fairly commonly practiced. Yeah. Um, I believe they, we were given some some maximum amount of pH adjustment you could, where you could use the, like the addition of an acid. Now, if you're using an ion exchange resin in the acid form, this doesn't count? If you use an exchange resin in the hydrogen form, you can reduce the pH to not below 3, 3.0. <clears throat> if you're trying to change the pH by adding acid, you're limited as to the amount of acid you can add. There's so many pounds per thousand gallons. But could you do both? You can do both if you want to. Who checks that? Oh. They check it, well, <laughs> they come around and check it before and after. I mean, you're not required to submit samples to the uh, government before and after ion exchanging, like you are if you're going to uh, QFEX a wine. However, you must maintain records of acids purchased, used, and on hand, which is checked by the federal government during the annual inspection. But uh, you could change the pH on your wine and get away with it, even if you exceeded the limit, because there'd be no one to check you unless. You're so unfortunate as to be uh, caught in the act. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, you get much less uh, H2S production with a uh, clear juice or clear hunt. Uh, uh, there's no way in law but is there any way that you can control this with red wine? None that I know of. In other words, red wines, you're just going to ferment them. Well, the thing I recommend our roads is to get them cleaned up as quickly as possible after the end of the fermentation. Did you have a question? Yeah. On the addition of uh, copper sulfide to get rid of hydrogen mm. sulfide, are you getting any uh, appreciable change in pH? No. You're adding a very small amount. What you do is to make up a, about a 1% solution of copper sulfate and uh, then dilute that down again and add it in the lab. And then allow it to stand and react for a short period of time, and then smell to see whether you got rid of the hydrogen sulfide or not, just to set up in a number of tubes. And the one that smells satisfactory, go ahead and filter and then analyze for copper to see if the copper content is increased appreciably or not. Yes? So you, your analysis for H2S is, is just sensory rather than using any kind of a, a test? Uh, up until very recently, it's been entirely sensory because we had no good analytical method for hydrogen sulfide. Now, Brian Crozier has developed a method that's good. So we have a good analytical method now. But we still have to relate the levels that we find with the analytical method to what the nose smells. You, you uh, recommended the uh, copper sulfate method over the uh, SO2, despite mm -hmm. the, the, the problems with the added copper. No, that's no problem because you have QFX to remove the added copper if you have too much in there. Of course, that's a rather expensive operation. Since the H2S is in an equilibrium, after you add the SO2, you drop out the H2S. Isn't there a chance of the H2S reforming? Yes. That's why you have to get rid of the elemental sulfur as soon as possible. Because it's an equilibrium reaction. Do you have a... Yes. Uh did you say your opinion on, you had a very low opinion of uh, trying to flash pasteurize premium quality wines? Mm -hmm. What sort of uh, effects have you seen that this has um, done to the wines? 
I had the experience of being in charge of winemaking for four years at Crystal Blanca, and we hot bottled. And I can assure you that it didn't do the wines any good. I've also practiced flash pasteurizing and <clears throat> bringing the wines down to about 80 degrees Fahrenheit into the bottle, and that does less damage than the hot bottling but you can still de detect the difference between that and the controlled sample. I'm very much against the use of heat on quality wines. Would it not be possible to, to bring the temperature well, just to hold it a very short amount of time? <coughs> Quickly, just in a matter of five seconds or so, bringing the wine back down to the <coughs> Well, if we had equipment that would have permit us to do that. The plate and frame heat exchanges are the best method we have for quickly raising the temperature and lowering the temperature again. But even with those, the wine is probably 30 seconds going up and coming down. And on delicate wines, you can almost immediately tell the difference in, uh, as a result of the heat treatment. Some wines are robust enough that you can't tell the difference, but as a general rule, heating does decrease quality. Now, one thing we haven't tried, and I think would bear investigating, would be to study the effect of heating in the complete absence of air. Now, we might be able to achieve what we want with heating and not have any deleterious effect if we don't have any air present. But that's a little bit difficult to do, too. Has there any, been any, any work done with uh, radiant heating or possibly yes. solar Yes. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Singler, I think, investigated practically everything along those lines when he was working on uh, the early uh, stages of his uh, wine aging practice. And uh, he came to the conclusion that everything that you did to the wine was probably bad for it. I think I'm inclined to agree with that. The less we do the wine, the better off we are. Any other questions? Uh, on refrigeration, uh, you gave us five times circulation in uninsulated tanks and down to cold. Uh, could you very quickly go over initial cost, capital cost, and operating cost of those? I do not have any figures at my fingertips. I'd have to look it up like I did the flow rate on the uh, on exchange column. I don't like to clear my mind up with that because I only have a limited capacity in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about uh, just the method? If, you were, if money was no object and you were mm -hmm. setting up uh, your program, how you're going to do your... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that money no object. <laughs> <laughs> The most effective method for rapidly de depositing tartrates is to circulate in an insulated tank. And that's the method I would recommend. Now, the advantage of a cold room is that you can put wines in the cold room and keep them in there for months, uh, especially wines that may contain some residual sugar or you may have uh, wines that uh, you bottle very slowly and you have them in a partially filled tanks, that's where a cold room really comes in handy. But f just from the standpoint of the quickest method of re reducing the tartrate content, circulate in refrigerated tanks, or insulated tanks, I should say. We run out of questions? Uh, if you wish to uh, iron if you don't want to lose much color, you can't afford to lose much color, or can, and does it help to increase the speed of processing of the resin, or will that slow your, your flow rate down? Mm. Yes, the, you would tend to exclude the, um, the uh, polymeric pigments. In other words, the dimers, trimers, tetramers, and perhaps larger ones with a highly cross-linked resin. Uh, 
and that would uh, tend to preserve the color, not take out so much color. Any other questions? It reminds me of an or the incident that occurred to me, I think my first year as a winemaker, a number of years ago. And this is a very old-fashioned uh, operation. There's a winery that had been reactivated <clears throat> that year. And standing empty all during repeal, wooden fermenters and a wooden trough <clears throat> At the front, underneath the fermenter, draw off the uh, wine down to um, sumps. And over the top of the sump was a copper screen. You put a man there with a broom to keep sweeping the pumice so the thing wouldn't plug up. And that little fellow, the name of Will Brown, is working for me. It's his first season in the winery. <clears throat> He's a rather excitable fellow. Anyway, he was operating in this broom, sweeping this thing clean. I came along, pulled out my cigarettes, and we lit up. Standing there smoking, all of a sudden, the uh, tank started running dirty. When you're drawing off a red tank, <clears throat> usually the pumice will float, and uh, you draw off pretty clear juice. Well, you get down near the bottom, and sometimes a lot of the pumice comes out. In this case, that happened. He came down, flooded the screen. He was frantically sweeping. The screen flooded over. I said, run up and shut it off the tank. He did. He came back, and he said, I dropped my cigarette in the sump. I said, well, I don't see it there. So anyway, he cleaned things up and went on about my way, and I came back around an hour later, and he said, uh, hey, boss, I found that cigarette. It's a light cigarette. It just lit up. I said, yes, what happened? He says, I guess I got pretty excited when that sump ran over. He says, after a while, as I didn't feel so good, I went outside and tossed my cookies and there was that cigarette. <laughs> the lighter cigarette he swallowed didn't even know it. <laughs> I have a number of other anecdotes about Will Brown I'll save for a proper occasion. <laughs>